As guitarist for pop rock superstar Brian Adams, Keith has heard some of his noodlings become records. And the, I think the guitar was starting to slip, and I thought, oh, I gotta do the solo, I'll just blast it, and I went. And I just went, and that was it. And, but that's what's on the track. You know, they left it, and I thought, that's fine, you know. <laughs> Keith Scott has played guitar on some of the biggest selling records of the past 30 years, backing up one of the top pop rock singer-songwriters, Ryan Adams. He had just recorded a record called You Want It, You Got It, which was his first foray into the American radio as a solo artist. He said, I'm going to go tour and hopefully we're going to get some, a break and go tour in America. And if it works out, I'll make sure you get you know, some studio time and, uh, and the next record. I said, okay, that sounds good to me. We started in Vancouver in October of 1981. Played the Commodore Ballroom, our first ticketed show. <laughs> and uh, we went across Canada in a van in the freezing cold. <laughs> we wound up in Toronto and, uh, well, we've been since working ever since that, that time. Keith has brought a cross-section of his favorite guitars to a recording studio in the Hollywood Hills. Beginning with his oldest and, without any question, most beat-up guitar. This guitar, I bought at Lama Quaid in Vancouver. Um, <laughs> it was brand new, believe it or not. Um, I'd taken it up to a club in Fort St. John and we met a guy who decided he would like to try and shoot bullets through it, so he did that. He shot two through here and it survived, so I thought, I gotta keep this guitar, it's too cool. We stuffed the bullets back in, but and we would just scrape it and do stuff to it and burn it and just for something to do when I was touring in the clubs I had nothing to do. And people signed their names on it, so most of the people that we'd been touring with in the early 80s and and I had it on the road for quite a few years, and they would just sign their names into it like a park bench. You can see all these different people's names I've met over the years, different road crews and band members. And Anyway, I finally took it off the road in the mid-90s because it was getting uh, pretty beat up. It's done a lot of great work for us, uh, from Cuts Like a Knife, Reckless, a lot of the tracking was done, the basic tracking, some of the soloing. Um, it was featured in a, and played on the track Please Forgive Me, which was recorded in the early mid-90s. And that's probably the last time I actually tracked with it, and I put it away. Still works. It's in tune, too. <laughs> Keith Scott can pretty much track his career with his collection of guitars. I bought this old, this 60, 1964 Strat uh, when I was uh, on tour with Journey. Uh, we were supporting Journey in St. Louis, and uh, that was my f first nice old vintage guitar I ever owned. Uh, since I was a kid, anyway, when I had my when I bought out of the newspaper. I think I paid 1500 bucks for it at the time with the case, and it looked absolutely brand new. Of course, I took it on tour, and look, this is what happens. <laughs> the finish just starts to come off. You wear these pants with these rivets on them, and But this is completely original, um, save for the odd replaced machine head that uh, wore down. But I really love this guitar. It's done lots and lots of sessions for me over the years. Um, still using it today. This is probably one I'll keep for the desert island because it's been good to me. Keith estimates he has about 50 guitars in his collection. A collection which began innocently enough buying guitars that were needed for the music. 
we got people involved to say, listen, can you help us find old instruments? And there was a couple of local people in Vancouver that were tuned in to the collecting crowd and they would make an effort and go find things on our behalf. And, and I think by the mid 90s, it became like almost a competition between Brian and I. I said, oh, I got this, so look what I found. And, and it was fun. This is a 1958 Gibson Les Paul Sunburst, which I, uh, I've had this for about 12 years. I found it uh, in Vancouver where I was living. I knew a guy that had, I knew the fellow that owned it, and he was going to uh, sell it off. And I got it before he went down to the United States to flog it to a big collector and gave him uh, a heck of a lot of money for it. But, you know, I love this guitar. It's great to play. It's got a wonderful neck. It's a great sound. I just, for me, I just love that tone of it. But the shame is, I'd never play it because I'm scared I'm going to knock it over <laughs> or break it or something. It's just crazy the amount of money that people ask for a piece of wood with strings on it. A few years ago, we were looking at maybe two to three hundred thousand, and I think it's dropped maybe to what 150 to 200 now. I certainly didn't pay that kind of money for it. This orange Gretsch was the first Gretsch guitar I ever bought. I do have an affiliation with Gretsch now because uh, I'm part of their um, artist um, signatures client list. So, But this guitar uh, was sold to me by a local writer in Vancouver, Alex Vardy. And I was always keen to find a cool old <laughs> Gretsch guitar. And he sold me this one. And I love it. It's great. It's orange. It plays when it's in tune, and uh, it's in excellent shape. I uh, used it on a very uh, popular Brian Adams video called Everything I Do, which led to the Gretsch people getting a hold of me and saying, would you like your own guitar <laughs> with your name on it? He may have used the Gretsch in the video, but he did not use it on the actual recording. At that time, we were using uh, one or two Fender guitars, Strats, I think. And it was one of Brian's Strats that I was using a lot of the solo work on the on Waking Up the Neighbors CD. And um, when the song came out, <laughs> if we were going to do a video. I said, oh, great. Um, where is it going to be? So it was going to be in a forest uh, south, southwest of London in England. I went, oh, like with trees and stuff around? Yeah, OK. Well, what's going to stick out in a green background? an orange guitar. So I picked this one and I thought they're never going to let me get away with this. But it made it to the video. So no intent to fool, just showbiz fun. And 30 years on, Keith Scott is still having fun. No fooling. The saying goes, a journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. For some, like Brian Adams' longtime guitarist Keith Scott, the guitar was a refuge, an alternative to a life heading down the wrong road. My mother was raising the four kids by herself, and um, at that time, I could have been influenced by a group of kids that weren't doing so well. And I was starting to hang out with that element, and I think once I came to a crossroads where I thought, well, I can go be with the crazy kids or I can go and just chill out. And by the time I hit high school, I was like 13 years old, I met other groups of kids that were interested in music and guitar. So I had to pick. Do I go with these guys who I think are cool, but they're trouble? Or do I go with these guys who are more into doing something? And I would come home, I remember as in my mid-teens, and I'd go and I'd turn on the FM radio station and I'd play along to the songs that were coming out of the radio at that time, which, you know, they played everything. And it challenged you when you're listening to the radio, oh, what's this, you know, and it made you think differently and then you'd go back. So, in, in a way, I, I got attached to it in, in, a, in a much broader sense because, first of all, I think it saved me as a person in many ways. 
because my tendency was to go to the dark side. But music always got me out of it. You know, I always found something to appreciate in music. Um, I, I can really say that guitar and the music associated with it has really helped me and saved me in, in, a, in, in so many ways. Thank you.